You probably have no idea how close Russia and Alaska actually are. Here in the middle of the Bering Strait are the Diomede Islands. Big Diomede is on the left and belongs to Russia, while Little Diomede sits on the right and belongs to the United States. These two small islands are just two miles apart, yet have a 20 hour time difference between the two. This two mile stretch is what separates the United States from Russia. But these two islands aren't just random rocks sitting out on the middle of an icy ocean. Both islands have a permanent population that aren't extremely friendly with each other. Each and every one of us here on this island, we're pretty much a lookout because we live on the most western front of Alaska. We watch 24-7, they watch 24-7. When we do get close to the island, either doing a fair warning shot, at times we can overhear them hollering at us in English, telling us to go back. We do get a warning, so the time we have it done, done, we hear a shoot, boom, boom, boom. They're like, almost like 50 caliber shells. Conflict between the two islands hasn't always been so tense. During most winters, the Bering Strait freezes into a couple feet of thick ice. Between 15,000 and 18,000 years ago, the first human beings crossed the Bering Strait and entered into North America. During the Ice Age, this narrow strip of land was known as Beringia and served as a gateway into North America for the very first time. Beringia was mostly land as the ocean levels were much lower given much of the world's water was stored in glaciers. As time went on and temperatures slowly rose, the ocean began rising and eventually all that was left of Beringia was the two rocks sitting in the Bering Strait, now known as the Diomede Islands. For thousands of years, people would still cross the ice bridge in the winter, making their way back and forth between what is present-day Alaska and Russia. For all these thousands of years, passing back and forth between the frozen sea was actually extremely normal given Alaska was owned by Russia all the way up until 1867 before actually becoming a US state in 1959. Furs were traded, ideas were passed along, but this bridge was mostly used as a migration route to get out of the frozen tundra of Siberia. This friendly passageway all came to a screeching halt during the Cold War. The Russian government and even our government prevent us from going over because of the international dateline. My grandma's from the Russia side. I don't know which side. It's just an imaginary line, that's it preventing us from not seeing our relatives over there. Look, Akani, там охотятся люди, знаете, там сейчас пограничники. Well, Gorbachev and Reagan was having a meeting in Iceland, recently. They uh, had heard about us here in the Bering Strait trying to open the border. And so he had a toast with Reagan. They toasted that someday maybe we'll be friends. <laughs> Suddenly, an ice curtain was declared between Big Diomede and Little Diomede during the Cold War in 1948, where Russia also closed the settlement on Big Diomede. The native families that would consistently travel between the islands were abruptly separated as the Russian government forced the residents of Big Diomede to move off the island and onto Russia's mainland. All roughly 80 residents that remain on Little Diomede today have relatives living somewhere in Russia. And although the Cold War has come to an end, the ice curtain still hasn't been lifted. The Russians are pushing and probing and seeing what they can achieve here. The U.S. is trying to figure out how best to defend against that sort of aggression. Although Big Diomede has a strong military presence, with lookout points established across the island, Little Diomede barely belongs to any government of its own. The island doesn't have access to television, any hospitals, restaurants, hotels, doesn't always have running water, or any airstrips allowing planes to land. The only way in and out of Little Diomede is through a helicopter, which isn't always accessible given the harsh climate of the Bering Sea. Not a single US governor has ever visited the small island that is just two miles from Russia, despite being in the news so very often. The irony behind all of this is that US government officials have been proposing a bridge or railway system connecting Russia and Alaska dating all the way back to the 1800s. And in fact, the official proposal for a transcontinental railroad was just released not long ago, and the details are pretty shocking. 
In 1890, Colorado Governor William Gilpin called for a new worldwide railroad system to connect the greatest cities on the five continents. His book, The Cosmopolitan Railway, envisioned a railroad bridge that would connect Russia and Alaska at the Bering Strait. Governor Gilpin wasn't alone as many engineers believed connecting the globe through a railroad system would be much more practical than flying through the air. Theodore Roosevelt was a strong proponent of the railroad system across the Bering Strait. However, Russian rulers at this time worried about a potential invasion of the gold-seeking Americans if a bridge were to be built. The Russians probably had a valid point given a record number of Americans were flocking to Alaska in search of gold during the early 1900s. And although the Russian leaders allowed natives to travel back and forth between Alaska and Russia, this leniency ended during the beginning of the Cold War. Fast forward to today in 2022 and, well, things are starting to change. Deep into the Arctic Circle, to the fast-changing front lines between U.S. and Russia. Arctica, важнейший region. While Russia's war with Ukraine seems far away from there, there are increasing tensions, and our warming planet means what happens in the Arctic Circle could have far-reaching implications for us all. There are other people coming into the Arctic, and we don't like it. China with the Arctic warming faster than anywhere else on the planet, the region will continue turning blue. World leaders are realizing this and are taking action to establish dominance in the Arctic. On September 29, 2020, the former U.S. President Donald Trump approved a permit for a proposed railroad connecting Alaska and Canada. This 1,600-mile rail line immediately started in construction, where the rail line will start in Delta Junction, Alaska, travel through the interior of Alaska into the Yukon province of Canada, before making its way down to Fort McMurray in Alberta, Canada. The trains would then carry passengers, piping, shipping containers, and sulfur, many of the products that are shipped across the Pacific Ocean on cargo ships. These railroads traveling across the Arctic Circle are ultimately looking to be the future of the shipping industry. The Alaska to Canada Railroad approved by President Trump won't be enough to speed up the supply chain and revolutionize global transportation as we know it. That is why the long-discussed Intercontinental Railroad is picking up traction. The current plan for what would be the longest rail system in the world includes a railway that would connect the following cities. Paris, Istanbul, and Berlin would be connected to East Asian cities and then eventually traveling across the Bering Strait into North America. The official proposal for the project indicates a railroad stretching for over 5,000 miles and including a 60-mile-long tunnel under the Bering Strait that passes right underneath the Diomede Islands. The route of the Intercontinental Railroad will place Alaska at the absolute geographic center of global commerce as more freight and cargo ships travel along the Pacific Ocean each year than anywhere else in the world. Shipping by railroad would not only provide faster shipping times than the extremely slow-moving cargo ships, but would also greatly reduce many harmful toxic emissions. Just for reference, these ICR trains can operate up to 130 kilometers per hour or 80 miles an hour compared to cargo ships at just 27 miles per hour or 43 kilometers per hour. And you may be thinking, but wait. These trains would have to travel so far north and then so far back down south that maybe the speed of the train would be offset by how far it has to travel when the cargo ships can just travel in a straight line across the Pacific. Well, little did you forget that the Earth isn't flat and we live on a globe. The actual shortest distance from the United States to China, for example, would be to travel towards the Arctic Circle and then back down to China. This is why all airplanes traveling from the United States to Asian countries travel up towards the Arctic, flying across northern Alaska, and then back down into the Asian countries to travel the actual shortest distance. Now, despite the vast benefits of an intercontinental railroad, the logistics behind the construction of the railroad wouldn't be cheap. The official proposal is estimating that the railroad would cost a little over $100 billion to construct. The plan is to get this railroad financed by many of the countries that would be benefiting from the railroad, such as the United States, Canada, Russia, China, and even European countries. 
The proposal indicates that $100 billion is actually a bargain given that the assets of the railroad would remain useful for 100 to 200 years or even longer. Meetings for figuring out the logistics are actively happening in Anchorage and Nome where leaders are trying to receive input from natives living in this area. Proponents of the railroad hope that the railway will improve the lives of the natives who are cut off from the modern technologies of our current society such as the AD residents living on Little Diomede Island. Anyways, if you learned something, be sure to hit that subscribe button and click this video right here to learn about why the northernmost town in Canada exists.